Son Excellence, euh, Monsieur Elemar Ndesaleng, Premier ministre de la République fédérale démocratique d'Éthiopie. Son Excellence, Monsieur Paul Kagame, Président de la République du Rwanda. Son Excellence, Madame Nkosasana Dlamini-Zuma, Présidente de la Commission de l'Union africaine, et ma sœur. Un mot de bienvenue à nos anciens chefs d'État ici présents, le Président Shisano Hoffman et Gohan. Mesdames et Messieurs, Monsieur le Ministre des Finances Mokhtar Oldiaï, représentant le bureau sortant, cher euh, Zainab Badawi, Mesdames et Messieurs, c'est un plaisir pour moi de vous accueillir à cette réunion annuelle conjointe du comité technique spécialisé de l'Union africaine sur les finances, les affaires monétaires, la planification économique et l'intégration et la conférence des ministres africains des finances, de la planification et du développement économique de la CA. Permettez-moi de saisir cette occasion pour exprimer ma profonde gratitude au Premier ministre Alemar et Dessalem, au gouvernement et au peuple éthiopien, non seulement pour la chaleureuse et généreuse hospitalité qu'ils n'ont cessé de nous réserver, mais aussi parce que c'est une expérience extraordinaire que d'être le témoin privilégié de la transformation socio-économique de l'Éthiopie et de s'inspirer de l'énergie et du dynamisme avec lesquels les réformes sont menées dans ce pays. C'est avec la plus grande reconnaissance que je mesure la valeur du partenariat stratégique entre la CA, la Banque africaine de développement et l'Union africaine. Le processus de l'agenda 2063 de l'Union africaine nous donne l'occasion, sous la conduite de la présidente Nkosasana de la Minizuma, de, de pouvoir laisser aux générations futures un riche héritage. Je voudrais aussi remercier les nombreux collègues de la famille des Nations Unies qui sont venus prendre part à la réunion annuelle du mécanisme de coordination régionale à un moment où il est crucial d'assurer la convergence pour appuyer de manière cohérente une stratégie panafricaine ciblée. Mesdames et Messieurs, un des principaux résultats de la réorganisation entreprise par la CA en 2013 avec votre concours est de nous permettre de mieux prendre en compte les priorités de nos États membres en matière de politique et leurs besoins de renforcement de capacités. À cet égard, nous continuons d'améliorer nos interventions dans le but de peser davantage sur les politiques en appui à la transformation de l'Afrique. L'année écoulée a été marquée par des travaux de recherche de grande qualité fondés sur l'analyse des faits et cadrement bien avec les besoins dans le domaine de la politique industrielle, des prévisions macroéconomiques, de l'égalité entre hommes et femmes, des progrès vers les objectifs du millénaire pour le développement, des inégalités, de la mobilisation des ressources intérieures, du développement du secteur privé, du commerce, des changements climatiques et des incidences socio-économiques de la maladie à virus Ebola. Cette contribution montre bien que la Commission est déterminée à poursuivre son chemin à partir d'une nouvelle conception et, si besoin en est, à proposer des idées qui dérangent. L'initiative consistant à établir des profils de pays est une contribution tangible à notre effort collectif. Ladies and gentlemen, while the last 15 years have been relatively high levels of growth driven by a commodity super cycle, and strong internal demand for a growing middle class, Africa is still dependent on commodities for most of its export earnings. There is now broad consensus that without diversified economies, Africa will remain prone to exogenous shocks and trapped in the paradox of high growth rates coexisting with high levels of unemployment and extreme poverty. It is for this reason that the last four issues of the Economic Report for Africa have investigated the fundamental policy questions and challenges facing the transformation process and endeavored to shed light on and bring coherence to policy priorities at national, regional, and continental levels. This new thinking on the way forward chimes well with the African Union's Agenda 2063 and the Common African position on the post-2015 development agenda. 
strengthened by our policy research, we continue to call for accelerated industrialization as key to the structural transformation of African economies. The big focus on industrialization demonstrates our commitment to ensure that policy research and statistics are strategically relevant to African government's priorities. The new industrial policies being developed by several member states and regional economic communities have greatly benefited from the research, statistics, and debates by our focus on this critical subject. The key factors constraining trade and industrialization in Africa are related to Africa's narrow production and export base, which is dominated by low-value products, such as raw materials and primary commodities. This is compounded by very high trade costs, tariffs and non-tariff barriers to intra-Africa trade, and Africa's access to international markets. We have no alternative but to increase our share of global exports. While in the 70s, Africa accounted for 4.99% of world trade, and East Asia, 2.25%. By 2010, we had regressed to 3.33, while East Asia had soared to 17.8. Limited by poor infrastructure and inefficient logistics, lack of adequate skills and quality inputs, insufficient provision of credit and financial services, ours has become a story of lost opportunity. The time has come for us to awake. Africa's current trade policy places trade as a, a major component of our ability to excel. The 2015 edition of the Economic Report for Africa suggests that our trade and industrial policies are now delinked from each other. As a result, African countries exhibit high levels of protectionism with no tangible benefits in terms of productivity improvements. This is exacerbated by rent-seeking behavior, which precludes the harnessing of the dynamic comparative advantages. Accordingly, tariff structures often do not reflect industrial policy considerations, but are the unsystemic result of successive rounds of reforms. If one looks more closely at imported inputs, it is clear that tariffs are weighing very heavily on the competitiveness of African countries. They stimulate neither the supply response upstream nor the competitiveness of downstream industries. When properly applied, Tariff structures are an instrument for a coordinated strategic approach and for consistency between trade and industrial policy frameworks. But this is not what is happening. I like to call such an approach, in fact, smart protectionism, better defined as making the rules work for you. Everybody wants it, but we have not succeeded in making it happen. Pursuing trade reforms is a strategic manner and a means of promoting and strengthening a country's competitiveness and creating favorable conditions for enhanced participation in the value chains. Where global value chains are concerned, there is a growing body of research that points to the relevance of the services sector in terms of both contribution to value addition and employment creation. Put differently, a dynamic services sector, think for instance of financial services or ICT, can exert wide-ranging spillovers that lift productivity and enhance value along the chain. Within Africa, however, trade in services is still restricted by a number of mainly regulatory barriers. Against this background, it is vital that negotiations for the continental free trade area also encompass intra-African trade in services. This would not only contribute to improve the scope 
for the emergence of regional value chains, but also ensure that the gains stemming from the creation of this continental free trade area are more fairly distributed among African countries, particularly those economies that are developing significant service hubs. In addition, harnessing trade strategically means that African countries ensure that the sequencing of trade liberalization is consistent with their transformative agenda and commitment to regional integration. In other words, the sequencing of trade liberalization should prioritize the reduction of tariffs and removal of non-tariff barriers within Africa. The fact is that Africa or inter-Africa exports often face higher levels of protection vis-a-vis -vis Africa's exports than to the rest of the world. And the situation may worsen. Our goal should be to have tariffs reduced between regional economic communities in order to avoid offering lower tariffs to Europe than those within Africa, which could become one of the consequences of the economic partnership agreements in the absence of this ambitious continental free trade area. Other limiting factors, such as non-tariff barriers, remain particularly pervasive and add to the burden weighing on the competitiveness of African producers as these barriers remain particularly high between regional economic blocks. Unilateral trade preferences alone can hardly enable the conditions required for developing value chains. I beg you, honorable partic participants, let us realize that we can no longer afford to negotiate trade agreements as if industrialization does not matter for Africa. We need to keep before us as our lodestar the message that trade can indeed support industrialization, but that harnessing this opportunity requires a coherent policy framework. Trade does not solve our need for financial innovation to propel transformation, but plays a critical role. Our domestic resources will increase by undertaking necessary equitable tax reforms. These reforms must address tax collection, closing loopholes, and widening the tax base. Moreover, our fiscal policies ought to address poverty and incentivize increased domestic savings. Private, private equity is also another source of wealth that is reducing Africa's reliance on traditional means of funding. In addition, the evolving development finance landscape, which witnessed the emergence of new actors and innovative aid modalities, offers scope for us to move beyond traditional dichotomies. By the time we meet again in July, here in Addis, for the third International Conference on Financing for Development, decisive steps would have been taken to sow the seeds of the continental free trade area as an essential pillar of Africa's structural transformation. The continental free trade area negotiations are not cost-free. African governments should take the necessary steps to meet these costs, including by ensuring that negotiating teams from each country are well-resourced. Hence, we need to make sure that our contribution and concerns are adequately reflected in our determination to alter the current course. The world will not stand by and wait for African countries to catch up. African countries need to be smart and to explore the linkages between political decisions and their coherence with trade and industrial policies and development strategies. Ebola was a brutal reminder to us of the fragility of our standing as perceptions, or rather said, misperceptions, threaten to erode the foundations that we fought hard to establish. It is all about risk. On one hand, ladies and gentlemen, risk may be defined as the potential to lose something of value. On the other, taking risks can bring us potential value. 
physical assets, health, social status, emotional well-being, financial gain, prosperity. Risks can be intentional and managed interaction with us and the managed interaction with uncertainty, unpredictability, and unmeasurability. Given these considerations, it is vital that Africa shed the perception of risk as a purely subjective judgment that may or may not be valid, and that it learn to take, Africa learns to take its own risks. I thank you.